Homework Hotline is supported in part by New York State United Teachers, working with parents and the community for our children's future. NYSET, a union of professionals, and by viewers like you. Hey, now let's take a moment so we all can figure it out what it's all about. It's the Homework Welcome to Homework Hotline, I'm Craig Zaramba. And I'm Donna Minio. Homework Hotline is the place where you can get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. For more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games, other online resources, and the latest episode of our show. And don't forget, we want to hear from you. We want to know if you think should school calendars change so that students go to school year round? Why or why not? You can weigh in on this topic and tell us what you think by visiting us on Facebook and leaving us a message, tweeting us by using the hashtag HHVoiceIt, or by visiting our website, homeworkhotline.org, and clicking on the Voice It button. Remember, the most thought-provoking responses will be put on air. The answers will be shared on tomorrow's Homework Hotline. And now, let's get to tonight's Creature Teaser. This invertebrate lives on one particular island off the northern coast of Australia. It has a small, compact body carried by eight spindly legs and two front claws. This creature is protected by a thick, shell-like outer layer called an exoskeleton. It is famous for its bright red color. This invertebrate lives on the forest, or in the forest on the island. It eats leaves, fruits, and flowers that have fallen to the forest floor. It moves around during the day, but prefers to stay in the shade as it needs to stay moist in order to survive. In order for it to not dry out during the dry season, this creature digs burrows and can stay in them up to two months. When the rainy season comes, this animal begins a large migration to the coast. It will climb over whatever obstacles stand in its way, roads, cars, even cliffs. Once at the ocean, this animal reproduces. Its young will spend a couple months growing up in the sea before returning inland to the forests for the rest of the year. If you think you can solve the creature teaser, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or just answer it on our website, homeworkhotline.org. Answer correctly and you could have a chance to share the answer at the end of the show. Every correct response will be added to our Hotline Hall of Fame, earn enough points, and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. All right, the past couple of Mondays, we've been talking about the Erie Canal. Cool. So I've got a couple of math problems I'd like to bring up in okay. regards to the Erie Canal. Sounds good. Okay, yes. so come on over. Let's take a look. Yesterday, we talked about the distance on the Erie Canal. If you remember Laura's um, problem, it was she was biking between two different... Um, towns on the canal well remember the formula that you can use if you're given the distance speed and time those are how you get the the distance the speed times time but it's this particular problem that Laura did didn't give us that and I'm not going to use that either but this is a great formula that in seventh and in eighth grade you need to remember all right, so if we take a look, here is a picture of the Erie Canal that I um, enlarged from yesterday. Over here is Albany, and there's like one, two, three, four, five locks right there in that little section. And then there's a bunch more over here. And look at how close they are. And remember, we talked about locks and how locks actually help a boat move up or down in the water based on the elevation of the area. So. This is something I found online that I absolutely loved. Um, it gave me the mile mark for each lock, but then it also told me over here if you were going up or if you were going down. And over here, in the, if you're going westbound, so if you're going from Albany toward Buffalo, you're going to go up. 
But if you're going from Buffalo toward Albany, you're going to go down. So that's a different way the lock has to work. And remember, on Monday, we're going to actually talk about how locks work. So let's take a look at this. Let's take those first five locks that are all right there crunched up together. So let's look at these five locks right here. So if I do that, I need this one here, this one here, because they're all Waterford. But if you notice, the E in the front stands for Erie Canal, and the number is which lock number it is once it hit the Erie Canal. So this is Erie Canal 2, Erie Canal 3, Erie Canal 4, Erie Canal 5. So there's a whole bunch of them right there. And here's another one. It's called Crescent, but it's still in Waterford. So there's our sixth one or our fifth one, sorry, I can't count today. Now, if we take a look at this, it's, the first one's at 0 0.63, and that's how many miles from Albany it is. And the last one is 2.15 miles from Albany. So if I take that, we can figure out the distance that those five locks are in, that space of time. So five minus three is two, uh-oh, I can't take six from one, but I can do the borrowing or the regrouping as they call it. And now I got 11. 11 minus six is five. And in 1.52 miles, we have five locks. That's a lot of locks in that small little distance. But it now what I really found interesting is here, we're gonna go up, we're raising up 33.64 feet, 33.45 feet. So we're just gonna keep going up. So let's take a look. We have 33.6, 34.5, another 34.5, and I'm gonna give myself a little bit more space, 33.3, and the last one was 33.0. So let's add that up and see how much we're gonna go up. So six plus five is 11, another five is 16, another three is 19, do the nine, bring the one. One plus three is four, plus another four is eight, plus another four is 12, plus three is 15, plus three is 18. Again, we're gonna carry. One plus three is four, plus three is seven, plus another three is 10, and the last two threes are six. So we have 168 feet that you're rising or lifting as they call it. You're getting lifted 168.9 feet in that small little section right here. That's a lot of height that we're being moved. So let's take a look at a couple of places closer. Let's, um, this is Herkimer, okay, where the diamond mines are. So we're gonna look here, let's go right here. They're really close right here, the Little Falls in Herkimer area. So we're gonna take a look at those two. So we're gonna come down here and we're gonna find, here's the Little Falls and the Herkimer is probably on my next one. So we're gonna go over another one here and here's Little Falls again, and here's your Mohawk, which is roughly your Herkimer area. So you're at 78.99 miles from Albany, and you're at 80, 83, I wrote right over my number, 83.19, okay. Let's see how many miles we had to go there. So nine minus nine is zero. Again, we can't do this, so we've got to borrow. So now we have 11 minus nine, which is two. Two minus eight, we can't do that. So we're gonna make that 12 minus eight, which is four. So in 4.2 miles, we're gonna be raising again. Let's see how much. We're going up 40.5 feet and then 24 feet. No, that's a zero at the end. So we end up with 60.5 feet that we are lifted from Little Falls to the Mohawk. So there's a lot of height. Your Erie Canal, let me put a blank picture in here. You're starting out here in Albany and then you're slowly 
you getting way up here? And it's not really leveling out. You're being lifted at each lock. You know, there's some spaces probably where it rides around the same and then you go up again. So you can see exactly where all these hills and these little ups and downs are. And that's why we need the lock. So stay tuned for next Monday and see how a lock works. Thank you. King Philip came over for great spaghetti is a silly way to remember the classification of animals and plants in science. The classification order is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Tonight on Homework Hotline, we head to the Seneca Park Zoo to find out what it's like being a zookeeper for rhinos and river otters. Take a look. It's funny, he does know my sound of my voice. He knows my keys when I'm jingling, when I walk. It's interesting that I can walk around anywhere in here. I don't have to say a word, but he still knows where I am. And you can watch his ears swivel around and you, oh, she's right there. My name is Tina Fest, and I'm a zoologist at the Seneca Park Zoo. I've been a keeper here for almost 29 years, and I've been taking care of the rhinos since they arrived 10 years ago. Bill likes to have contact. He likes to be touched and brushed and petted, and we also use that as reinforcement for training. He also likes bananas. He didn't know he liked bananas when he first got here. He doesn't like showers. He prefers mud baths. It protects their skin from biting insects. It also protects him from the sun so he doesn't get sunburnt. He likes to be brushed, so we wait till the, the mud dries on him and then brush him off. And I do have a good relationship with him. I think that's important too, is that he recognized me as, as, as his friend and tr a trusted person that he knows I'm not gonna bring anyone in here that's gonna harm him. And that means a lot. I'm Katina Wright, and I am a zookeeper here at Seneca Park Zoo. This will be my 13th year here. I started volunteering here back in the 90s for five years, and then I got hired in 2004. My area at the zoo is primarily the Eco Center, uh, the Genesee Trail, as well as the reptiles in the main building. Working with otters and reptiles is a little different, but also the same. You have to do a cautious approach to both. Um, I'm venomous trained. I work with the uh, Eastern Mass Saga rattlesnakes, as well as free contact with the river otters, which means I'm right next to them with no barrier. And both situations, you always have to be on guard. You cannot be complacent. You have to be 100% confident in yourself and your abilities. When I first started working with the otters, they actually weren't trained at all. We didn't have any kind of training program, but they had a very positive relationship with people. So back in, I think it was 2008, I started the first otter training program. And we had an otter admiral. Originally, they just wanted me to get them to go on a scale, get target trained, and do a few behaviors for medical purposes. And Admiral ended up loving it so much, it grew and grew into this huge otter enrichment demo that we have two days a week. They still get trained every single day, free contact, and they do behaviors like recycling. They can hold a position on their back. They'll let me check their paw, stand up, station on a stump, and swimming on their back and doing a dive off of the rock into the water. It just gives you such a thrill to have them learn a behavior you're trying to teach them. On your worst day, they're just happy to see you. It's just nice having you know, your work just love you back. So I never knew that, that they trained for a specific reason. I thought it was like for show, but it's actually mm -hmm. so that they can check the animals to see how healthy, look at you know the animal's body without the animal just running all over the place in the pen. Yeah, and it's really great to see that um, they're not, they don't just have survival instincts. Sure. They actually have the ability to learn as well. Sure, Just Skills. like our dogs yes. and our cats yeah. and you know, yep. all animals can do that, I guess. Yes. So you can see this video again or others like it by going to our website homeworkhotline.org. All right, um, we've been working on genetics. I'm gonna yeah. continue on. That right. sounds great. Come on along. 
All right, so we started earlier this year about how life has existed and how we've grown to where we are today. And we started last week about what genetics is. And genetics is the study of how traits are passed from parent to offspring, all right? And that those traits are carried on chromosomes. And for, for humans, we have 46 chromosomes. And sometimes on uh, the it's not like they're trying to trick you, but you have to understand that we have 23 pairs, which equals 46 individual chromosomes. And for most organisms, you need only that number. All right, if you have more than that, yet, uh, bad things happen. And Down syndromes is one of those possibilities that can happen by having an extra number 21 chromosome, which leads to uh, Down syndrome. Not always the case though. There are some plants, strawberries that have extra sets or uh, bananas have extra sets of chromosomes, which causes them to have bigger fruits, all right? So it's not always bad. We talked about what we are, eukaryotic organisms, which means our uh, cells, our DNA is contained within a nucleus. We actually have a true nucleus. And then we talked about prokaryotics a little bit and how they are cells that have uh, no true nucleus. So the DNA is like kind of free swimming out in the cytoplasm of the cell. All right, we talked about what, once uh, uh, we start getting into genetics, it's about developing a vocabulary. And um, our father of that, we'll, we'll get to in just a second, started um, describing these things. Uh, purebred is like if you have a dog that's just one kind of dog, German Shepherd, a Pit Bull, a Chihuahua, it's one, and they call that homozygous. Um, if you have a dog that is uh, multiple breeds in one, they call it a hybrid because it contains more than one kind of genetic information for that species. And then we started talking about what traits are. Traits are things that you possess that allow you to be more successful or allow an organism to be more successful in their environment. And you get those traits because you get an allele. One allele from mom, one allele from dad. And those alleles can be <clears throat> carried on our genes. And just recently, it was in like 2009, that they finished the Human Genome Project, which allowed them to map every single trait that we as human beings carry on every single chromosome, all right? So that's gonna play a role as time progresses on treating diseases, genetic disorders, uh, whether or not you carry certain G uh, DNA that's gonna cause you to become sick later on in life. All right, our chromosomes, um, we have a complete coded set, which you get because of mom and dad. All right, and then those things are the traits that you possess that you will pass on to your children. All right, now we talked um, about what dominant and recessive is. All right, dominant are the traits that are most often seen in a population, and recessive ones are ones that kind of stay hidden, and there's only a couple ways that you can actually possess or uh, demonstrate or possess those. For us, we like to say that most of the traits we have are either dominant or recessive, but there's a lot of them that are actually called incomplete dominant. You see this in plants, like if you take a red carnation and a pink carnation or a white one and you mix them, you get pink. Um, if you take people that are light colored skin with a person that's dark colored skin, have babies, they have children that are um, a mixed colored skin, all right? And that's because of the genes that interact that cause the expression of that trait. So. Genotype, and this is where we're gonna get into today and we're gonna be talking about um, how you can predict stuff that you might actually present or actually might express or actually pass on to your children. Now the geno, if you look at the word geno, gene means what's inside of you. So when I look out at like Donna or other members of the staff here, I can say the genos, I don't know what their genes are, but I can see what's being expressed. I can see brown eyes, blonde hair, blue eyes, tall, short. Those are the expression, the phenotype, what gets expressed because of the genes that you actually have, all right? So now this guy, uh, Gregor Mendel, which is the father of our genetics that we know today, he developed this Punnett square, all right? And a Punnett square is a tool that lets you predict what kind of uh, traits can be expressed in an organism, all right? And we know that females are XX and guys are XY. So when you have children, we do a Punnett square, you bring one letter down and one letter across, and then one letter down and one letter across. And so in this first one, you get an X and an X, the second one, you get an X and an X. And then we do the same thing, we'll change colors here. And for the second box, we bring down, we bring across. And normally when they do this, they put the X first, and like ladies are first, uh, when you go to a restaurant or hold the door open, you let the ladies go first. So when you have children, you always have a 50-50% chance of having either a boy or a girl, all right? So now this genotype right here, these are the letters, all right? So I have XX, and then I have an XX, which means I can have two, children, all right, and I can have um, XY, or I can have XY, and I can also have two. So now the genotype ratio is two to two. 
Now that's X's, but when I look at people, I don't see XX or XY. What I see or is male or female. So I can also have the same phenotype. I can have two female, two, a ratio of two male, or one to one, okay? So now let's take a look at some other things. Let's say, let's say we do a Punnett square. Now when Gregor Mendel developed his uh, vocabulary, he used capital letters to represent dominant traits. And we use eye color as one of those because people, you, that's one of the first things you see on someone, you, you look at their eyes, all right? And they use the capital letter B to equal brown eyes, all right? And then you use the recessive little b to equal blue eyes. So. Brown eyes is the dominant characteristic, the dominant trait that gets expressed most often in a population. Now when um, you take these cells, you can either be a homozygous dominant, which means you carry both big B, big B, or you can be heterozygous dominant, which means you carry the recessive trait, but you express brown eyes. So when uh, individuals, and this could be mother or father, or mother or father, doesn't matter, again, when we cross, we bring one letter in, one letter crossed, and you put the capital letter first, but because we have both capital letters contributing, this individual is gonna be homozygous brown eye. All right, and then we do it again. Here we cross over and cross over. We have again, capital letter, capital letter. So now we have a 50% chance of having a child that's gonna be homozygous brown eyed. But look what else you can have. You can have an individual that could be a carrier for the blue eye gene. All right, here we have homozygous. They have brown eyes, but they carry that blue eye gene. And then here again, we also have another individual or possibility of an individual that can carry that blue eye gene. So now the interesting part is if we take these individuals here. So now let's say we have mom and dad, all right? And mom and dad are both brown eyes, okay? So here we have mom. She's a carrier for blue eyes, but she has brown eyes. And here's dad. He's a carrier, but he also has brown eyes. And now you have a little sister, and she has blue eyes. So how do you have a kid that has blue eyes? Well, here we go. See, the possibility, this doesn't say every child. It's a possibility of what you can have. All right, here we bring in. Now here we have a little b, but we bring the capital letter first and a lowercase. So now this is homozygous dominant, meaning we get both dominant traits. This is a heterozygous dominant. It expresses as the dominant trait brown eyes, even though it carries the recessive. Here again, we have a big B and a little b. That's, it's gonna be heterozygous dominant. It expresses the dominant trait even though it carries it. And lo and behold, here's the big winner right here. You can have a blue-eyed child even though both parents are brown eyes. Now they've seen this in nature where they've had white buffalo born in nature. Well, how do you have a white buffalo if all the other buffalo are brown? All right, and the reason is because there must have been a mother and father that were carrying that recessive trait for white fur. Same with you can have mom and dad, brown eyes, but carry blue eye gene. Hope that helps you guys out and stay tuned for more. The Netherlands is a small country that is located in Western Europe between Belgium and Germany. This country might not even exist today if it was not for the Dutch. The North Sea would have washed the Netherlands away over the centuries, but the Dutch built a series of canals, dams, and pumping stations to keep the sea and rivers from flooding. Animals have had to adapt to the canals and dams just like the people who live in the Netherlands. The government has created animal sanctuaries throughout that allow for plants, birds, and small animals to thrive. If you visit the Netherlands, you will see tulips and wooden windmills. The windmills have helped drain water from the land for over 600 years. Today, the Dutch use other sources of flood control that are more modern. Many people also ride bikes in the Netherlands. There are three times more bicycles than there are cars. winner in tonight's creature teaser. Hi Alexander, how are you? I'm good. How Excellent. are you? We're good, thanks. We're very good. We're anxious to hear who what we were talking about. The answer is a Christmas Island red crab. All right. So now did wow. you know this or were there clues that we gave you that helped you out? that you gave me that helped me out. Right. You told me that it was an a red invertebrate. So what does invertebrate mean? Oh, I put you I, on the spot uh -oh. there. I think it means 
that... No bones. No, no bones. bones. Yep, no bones. That's what invertebrate means. So what were the clues again? You were talking about clues that we gave you. You said it's a red invertebrate that lives off the Australian... Coast, right? Yeah. Coast. There you go. Excellent. Yeah. Cool. So now there's something unique about where you're calling from. Where are you at, Alexander? I'm in Milton. And where's that? Milton, Ontario, Canada. Canada. Ontario, right. Canada. So we're, oh, oh, we're great. picking us up way up north. That's cool. <laughs> and I've called before, actually. Oh, right. well, good. Thank well, you, thank you very Alexander. much, Alexander. <laughs> and congratulations. Don't forget, every correct response is going to go into our Homer Hotline Hall of Fame, earn enough points, and you, just like Alexander, could win a tablet at the end of the season. Tomorrow on Homework Hotline, we travel to Oliver's Candies in Batavia, New York to see how peanut brittle is made. Good night. Good night. Homework Hotline is supported in part by New York State United Teachers, working with parents and the community for our children's future. NYSET, a union of professionals, and by viewers like you.